Well, good morning. Uh, we're going to look at a really, actually, pretty long story. One of the longer stories in all of the Gospels. It comes from the ninth chapter of John. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about the Gospel of John is these, these really long stories where we just get sometimes a few sentences or a paragraph or two in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John takes the time to unpack these stories. So we don't get as many, but we get longer and more in-depth. And that's, uh, that's the one we get today uh, when Jesus heals a man born blind. And before we get into the story, though, I want to tell you two things um, that I've read about in the news just to help us have sort of the right frame of mind. So one was um, about uh, an experiment that was done where they took all of these children who were born in India who, who were born blind, but then a technique was developed to do surgery to give them their sight. And, and that's not the experiment. Um, they, they did, they, were, they raised money and they got the surgery for these kids. The experiment was, they wanted to know, they wanted to, to know, did these kids know what things were that they had known by sight, or, or rather by touch, that now they could see them? Uh, si simple objects like a, a box or a ball uh, that, that you look at it and you know what it is. They wanted to know, uh, would that knowing it by feel transfer into their minds of knowing it by sight? Uh, and what they found was, no, that, that the ability to see something and know what it is, is a learned ability, which really makes sense when you stop and think about it, but they didn't know that. So it took these kids... Uh, uh, anywhere from a few weeks to a month or more to really start to learn that when I see a box, it's a box. When I see a ball, it's a ball, because they didn't have it in their mind. If they felt it, they knew. So they were working, they, they were learning how to teach these kids to recognize things by sight that they already knew by touch. Uh, the other is a story about a man in Canada who is 68 years old and legally blind, uh, could not see, uh, could see very, very little. And one day he fell down the stairs. That's, you know, that's a tragedy. That's a terrible thing. 68 year old man falls down the stairs uh, and he shattered the bones around his eyes. And and when he was then meeting with a plastic surgeon about getting surgery to fix all these bones, the surgeon asked him in a real kind of nonchalant way, oh, while we're repairing those bones, do you want us to fix your eyesight too? To which this man was greatly surprised. He did not know that was an option. When he was, he was 68 years old, when he was a kid, it wasn't an option. He had a, a, a problem with his eyes that now they can fix rather easily. Um, and so um, he had that surgery done. And, and it's really neat if you, if you just search on the internet for Canadian man born blind, get sight after falling downstairs, you'll find the story. And, and he, he, he's so excited, he says everything is beautiful to him now. But some things still confuse him. Uh, he's learned about how to differentiate the value of money uh, by looking at a $5 bill or a $10 bill. And colors can be confusing for him because he couldn't see any color before what little he could see. Um, and sometimes, uh, though, when he sees something, he has to feel it to remind his brain what it is, which I found that very interesting. Uh, and, and, but he just, he said every day is a, a new adventure because he's seeing new things every day. He gets to see flowers and trees and, and, all, and birds and all these things he heard, now he can see. Uh, and, and he said he just... He just like he's, he has the excitement of a child all over again. So also in our story, uh, you see this is a picture of the Pool of Siloam. And it uh, was built about 700 years before Jesus lived as a, a sort of a secret or secure water source for the city of Jerusalem during a war. But then, uh, during the Jewish revolt in the year 70, the Roman army destroyed it, and it was lost. 
and it wasn't rediscovered until 2004, and they still haven't excavated most of it because it's underground, and the, there's, you know, there's buildings and houses and things above it that they don't want to tear down. Um, but uh, here, I'm also going to show you, uh, it's, okay, Jesus is walking along. And he's talking with his disciples. He's in Jerusalem. And here's a picture, an artist's rendition of Jerusalem. And you can see, I marked there the Pool of Siloam. And up on the top right of the city, that one big thing, that's the temple complex. That's, that's where anytime you, you hear them going to the temple, that's where they're going. So they're not terribly far away from it. They're, they're, uh, Jesus was walking to and from the temple quite often. As they're walking along, they would have passed this pool several times. There were, there were some other pools and, and water sources in Jerusalem, uh, but it's interesting that this is the one that Jesus sent this man to. And, and um, I promise we will get to the actual story. I just want to show you these things before we start the story. So this one is an artist's rendition of the man washing his face after Jesus or sort of it's the process of Jesus healing him. But they didn't discover the real place till 2004. So uh, it actually probably, you know, it's, that's kind of rubble and ruins and stuff, but it actually probably looked more like this. You can see this is a, an artist's rendition based on the excavations they've done. Uh, um, kind of a, a, a funky shape, and it would have had stairs on, on all the sides but one, and, and the stairs were where they think for getting in and out of it easily at whatever level the pool was at, it would rise and fall seasonally during the wet and the dry season. So I want you to remember all these things about there's this pool there and about the, the, uh, the, the eyesight and how people who can't see, who haven't been able to see, they don't know what things are. They don't have that visual memory uh, and, and they don't have that visual catalog in their mind. So when they see something, they're over and over again, what is it? But they have the excitement, that man, that 68 year old man, he said he had the excitement of a child because he's experiencing things over again or, well, experiencing them in new ways. So here we will begin. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Okay, we cannot go from the particular, this one guy, and make a general rule. We can't say this guy was born blind so the power of God could be seen in him and say, okay, people who are born blind are born so we can show the power of God. We can't say that. That's actually, we're violating one of the rules of logic by going from a one particular thing to say this applies to everything. Because in general, we say that sin, that it's, that it's not a particular sin that caused as a person to be blind. Or, or other tragedies, but it is the sinfulness, the brokenness within the world as a whole that causes these things to happen. Except in this guy's case where we're told specifically, it's so God's, God's glory, God's power can be revealed to him. So, goes on, Jesus says, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. So night is coming, he says. That night is the crucifixion. Um, he also makes an I am statement here. He says, I am the light. They're scattered throughout John. You have these statements that Jesus says. And here it is, I am the light. Then he spit on the ground made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed 
and came back seeing. From time to time when Jesus does a healing, he'll do these physical things. He doesn't have to. He doesn't even have to be where the person is who, who needs to be healed. He can just say the word and it happens. We, we see that from time to time too. But when he does do something physical like this, something that imparts the healing, because he doesn't have to, he's doing it so we can learn something. There's, there's a, a, an object lesson going on here. And here I think the object lesson is tied to him specifically telling that man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. And Jesus has just been talking about being sent as the light into the world. And he sends this man to this pool, that means sent, to receive his sight. So we see all of that taking place. Jesus and his disciples go on their way. The man goes back, and his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I'm the same one. So apparently to these people, sorry to say, all these beggars probably kind of look alike. And in fact, that's one of the main complaints that, that people who are very poor, and especially the homeless, say is people don't look at them. And, and when we don't look at them, we rob them of their humanity. They feel less than human because people won't look at them. It's a very simple thing. But it makes us uncomfortable. But so, so, the, so this guy finally convinces some of them, or maybe they're just curious, and so they asked, who healed you? What happened? If you're that guy who used to sit here and beg, and you were blind, and now you can see, what happened? And he told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he said, because while he was washing, Jesus and his disciples left. Then, this is really, this is important and tragic. They took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, not because now he can see and they're happy, but because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. A lot of times as this drama is playing out, we see it as this, this, we have Jesus on the one side and the religious leaders on the other side who are jealous of Jesus and want to shut him up. But what we see here now is a group of people who don't like what Jesus did. They're just common people. They're, they're his neighbors and friends, it says. And they took him to the Pharisees to complain that Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. They're like, that's breaking the law. It's against the law to do that. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. They understood that to mean you can't work, not even healing people. So really what we got now is all of a sudden this story is going to turn into a police procedural drama. This is like what you would watch on TV if you watch those police shows that they kind of follow the detective throughout the whole time and they follow the lawyers. That's what this is going to turn into. So here's this Pharisee, or I mean this, this blind man who was blind and now can see, standing in front of the, the Pharisees. They're, the, they're, the, they're like the police. The Pharisee asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put mud on my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous things? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. It's, like, it's either he's a terrible sinner because he just broke a really important law that helps define our society and who we are, or he's sent from God and someone really special who doesn't need to follow that law. Then the Pharisees again question the man. See, this, this is like the police grilling him over and over again. They, they, they questioned the man born blind and demanded, what's your opinion? 
about this man who healed you? What do you think of this Jesus? To which the man replied, now remember, a few minutes before this, maybe an hour before this, he was blind, a blind beggar and now he can see. And he's got that excitement. He's got, this is like the happiest day of his life and they're ruining it. The man replied, I think he must be a prophet because who else could do such a thing? So they're, now they're cross-examining. They're going to cross-examine the witnesses now. Now they're like the lawyers. So the Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man who had been blind and could now see. So they called his parents. This is a cross-examination of witnesses. And they say, they asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? And if so, how can he now see? Well, his parents replied, you know, they're being grilled by the police and these lawyers, and they're nervous. They say, well, we know this is our son. There's no denying that. And, and that he was born blind, we can testify to that. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. I go back and forth on how hard I should be on these parents. You know, they kind of throw their son under the bus here. But they're, I mean, these are not the people you want to mess with. These people they're talking to have, the, have, have tremendous power over them and their lives and their family. His parents said this because they're afraid of the Jewish leaders who announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. They're going to kick him out of church. That's why they said he's old enough. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been, been blind, and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. They've already decided he's guilty. It's a, it's, a, it's a rigged jury. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind, and now I see. You know, it's amazing grace. That's where it's from. Once I was blind... And now I see. It's, to this man, it's very simple. He was blind. Now he can see. Jesus is responsible for that. But what did he do, they asked. How did he do it? How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed. I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now... He's just getting sarcastic because he knows the answer to that question. But he's fed up with these people. Then they cursed him and they said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. So then he goes on. Why? That's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes. It's that simple to this guy. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one's been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man not, were not from God, he couldn't have done it. See, he's, he's using really pretty basic simple logic here they believe good things from come from god and when people do good things they come from god so this guy obviously has connections to god because he's doing these things and good things come from god you were born a total sinner that's what the pharisees said to him are you trying to teach us and they threw him out of the synagogue. They may have physically thrown him out, but what that really means is they're kicking him out of church. He can't go to worship there anymore. He's not allowed to be part of their community anymore. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man. Rumors fly pretty fast that this man was healed, that word got around, and that this, this man was kicked out of the synagogue, that gets around, and then Jesus finds him. He goes looking for him. And he asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? That's what Jesus called himself, the Son of Man. The man answered, Who is he, sir? 
I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said. Couldn't have said that to this guy a couple hours earlier because he couldn't see. Now he can see. And Jesus says, you see him and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said. And he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, Okay, before I read this, this is important. They're not alone. I, I, as a kid, I always envisioned this sort of in a back alley or in a real private corner somewhere. They're in public. The people are around them. People are eavesdropping and listening. And Jesus says to him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, which he just did, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Those people right over there listening to us, eavesdropping on our conversation, those Pharisees who just kicked you out of the, out of the synagogue and said you're not good enough to worship with them, with them I came to show those who think they can see they're blind. Well, that didn't go over well with the Pharisees because some of them were standing nearby and heard him and asked, are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. This is one of the most profound things Jesus ever says. If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. It's all, we have, we have light and dark and sight and blindness and prophets and sin or from God and sin. All going on in this story, these, these, these themes going back and forth and that's where Jesus ends up here is with, if you, were blind, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. In other words, if you didn't know any better, if you recognize that you're a sinner, you can have forgiveness. But if you remain guilty, if you believe you can see, if you think you're not blind, if you think you're not a sinner, because you can't claim those things, well, you're going to remain guilty. You're going to remain in your sin. It's so... It, if we want forgiveness, it's really only one thing we have to do, and that's admit we're sinners. The Pharisees couldn't accept Jesus because they didn't think they needed him. But Jesus says those who think they don't need him, well, they're stuck where they are. They're stuck there, and they think they're in the right place. It's, it's, in closing, I just want to compare this to another thing that Jesus says real quick. That, that he talks about the only unforgivable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Which, that troubles people sometimes and, and, and they get bothered. It's like, how do I know if I did it? If I don't know what it is, the sin against the Holy Spirit. It's this simple. It is very simple. Forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ. If you refuse to believe, and, and it comes by the power of the Holy Spirit to us since he's now uh, you know, ascended back into heaven. So the power of the Holy Spirit brings us forgiveness. If you believe that the Holy Spirit cannot bring you forgiveness, you're stuck in your sin. You're, you can't be forgiven because the very thing that's coming to forgive you, you want no part of. That's why Jesus says, anyone who comes to him will find forgiveness. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for this, uh, this in incredible story here where, where Jesus not only touched the life of this one person, but by touching the life of this person, touches the lives of so many others. By by singling out a person that others had said was being punished by God for his sin. 
you show the power of God in bringing healing and wholeness and sight to the blind. We pray, Lord, that this would, this would bring us comfort and assurance that you are indeed our loving and gracious God. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.